Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Earrings Off. We want to invite you to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. You can find us on Facebook at Earrings Off Podcast and on Instagram at The Earrings Off Podcast. Welcome to Earrings Off. I'm Lou. And I'm Teresa. Let's get started. Okay, we are here today with Melvina Goodman Randolph. And uh, welcome to Earrings Off. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Melvina, can you share a bit about your life journey? Um, Talk to us a little bit about that. Wow. Well, thank you for the invitation to be a guest on Earrings Off. I love the, the name of, of the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <Yes. laughs> so I am a native of Brooklyn, New York. I'm a proud native of Brooklyn, New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I have uh, seven or well, six siblings. And so we grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Bushwick, Brownville, all these textured areas mm-hmm. of New York. And I was exposed to drug addiction, prostitution, a whole lot of things early on Mm -hmm. in my life. So I kind of, I guess, have this knowledge of street life. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, but despite growing up in this type of neighborhood, my mother was, she really advocated education. So we grew up on public assistance, but that was my mother's push was Mm -hmm to get educated. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things my mother always told me was I was ambitious and I was smart. Mm -hmm. So although we grew up on public assistance Mm -hmm. and we were impoverished and all of that and all these other things were going on around us, my mother drank alcohol excessively, my father, Mm -hmm. all of that, but still just her telling me that, that that has stuck with me throughout my life journey. And even in my making decisions, you know, that I made, I got pregnant at 16 or 17 and had my daughter dropped out of high school. I love school, Mm -hmm. uh, but I dropped out of high school because I was pregnant and that just kind of, you know, uh, evolved just into a whole other life of heartbreak and disappointment and you know, you start out drinking alcohol to smoking reefer, as we called mm-hmm. it in the mm-hmm. 60s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then on to sniffing cocaine. And so, you know, I worked for the state of New York for, you know, some quite some number of years. And, you know, my addiction just kind of took off, you know, wow. there. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, I was partying, having fun until it wasn't fun anymore. You know, like anything in life, we have fun with it. And then it's like, okay, it's mm-hmm. just time to move on to the next thing because I had some unfulfilled dreams and that was to be a teacher. Okay. Because my mother told mm-hmm. me how smart I was, but because I had dropped out of high school, then that was something that was not fulfilled because I was partying over here and partying over there, mm-hmm. just having a great time. And so by the time I got in my thirties, I realized like, okay, my life is going nowhere very fast and I want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I sought help Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from my primary care physician Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of my addiction. So Mm -hmm. um, I got on that journey through Narcotics Anonymous. So I'm still a member. I've been clean from alcohol and drugs for 32 years. Actually, I just wow. congratulations. Congratulations. on June 3rd was my clean date. Wow. And so yeah, so 30, 34 glorious years of mountaintops and valley experiences, mm-hmm. but I'm still here. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And you look yeah. marvelous, dear. Oh, thank that. you. <laughs> but listen, um, um, Teresa, just indulge me for a minute, because I want to, I want to skip a bit to when you say, you, you just thought about my life's not going anywhere and it's time to make a change. So, but was there a specific incident that motivated you to change? Was there something that happened or was it just a culmination of things? Yeah, it just was. I just got to that point where like, yeah, I mean, I had lots of heartbreak. I mean, this, 
<laughs> lots of that. I said I have so many um, male casualties still. Male on the casualties, <laughs> heartbreak, you know, or yeah. what, you know. So I, I hurt people. People hurt me, and you know, just partying and all of that. Just a, after a while, it just has no meaning. It's like, okay, so is this what your life is going to be? And so it was just kind of me coming into a sense of what I wanted, but not knowing how to get there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that was just, yeah. it was a, a, a moment of clarity, I guess, okay. is what we uh-huh. call yeah. it. And at that time, um, I wasn't really, I don't consider myself to have been a religious person. I didn't have a relationship with God at that time. I knew who God was. I mm-hmm. used to go to church, but that wasn't really, that, that wasn't the thing. It was, yeah, I came to a sense of myself and then I began to seek God out mm-hmm. in terms of making a change mm-hmm. for my life. Okay. Talk about <laughs> words having meaning, right? So as a young child, your mom told you you were smart. And many, many years later, that resonated with you and was actually sounds like the impetus for you seeking that help and getting off of that addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, that's so powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, how can we help someone if they're struggling with addiction? So addiction is, it's a, I know a lot of people look at it various ways. It's been said that it's a moral deficiency. Mm-hmm. It's a disease. And it is just like high blood pressure or any of the other things, because people bring those types of disorders on themselves as well by mm-hmm. eating correctly and Absolutely. all kinds of things. But mm-hmm. we don't really blame people mm-hmm. who have heart conditions and high mm-hmm. blood pressure and diabetes. We don't blame them for their condition. Mm-hmm. People with addiction, we tend to blame them mm-hmm. for, you know, well, if you wasn't drinking so much and if you wasn't using drugs, and if you, you know, it's like, okay. And all of that might be true, but I think in order to help someone with an addiction, we really have to listen to them because really, and I think it's true of all of us, we're not asking people to solve our problem. We want to be listened to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I'm a believer that the answers that we're seeking are within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we just don't make space for people to just talk. Right. And yeah. so if, if we could just listen to what their pain is and not feel like we have to fix it, you know, so, you know, providing just a listening presence is just really, really important. Being non-judgmental, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I don't have, and, and you don't really have to understand it to be in a position of just having some compassion, Mm-hmm. Right. I don't have to have gone through. I know a lot of times people think, well, if you haven't gone through what I've gone through, you don't, you can't understand. And you could just say, no, I really don't understand, but I want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't walked in those shoes, mm-hmm. but I would love for you to tell me about your shoes. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Tell me about how that fits your life. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think oftentimes just listening to people and just not blaming them Mm -hmm. and asking them, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, how can I help? And they can say, Hey, I don't know. Maybe we can figure this thing out together. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Melvina. Just like you said, just listening, creating the space. And one thing that I've learned in my life is to, and I still struggle with this and work on it, not feeling like I have to fix it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And because when you love someone and they're precious mm-hmm. to you, they're to you, you don't want to see them struggle. You don't yeah. want to see them in pain. Right. And so you're trying to figure out if there's something you can do, but they're going to have to walk through that. And many times it's just stepping back and just being there. Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. something, and that's, that's the hardest hard. part. The hardest yeah. part is for loved ones to watch their loved one going through. Yeah. And knowing that there isn't anything that I can do. However, for loved ones, there are programs for family members. Okay. Because family members often are, there's this, these codependent relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there are, uh, right here in Richmond, actually, there's this uh, McShin Foundation. They uh, 
provide addiction services to the addicted person, but they also educate the family about the disease of addiction. There is um, adult children of alcoholics is a, it's a type of a 12 step program similar mm-hmm. to NA and AA, but it's uh, geared to what family members mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that, you know, because family members get injured <laughs> by some of this behavior and they don't have a place where they can talk through. So just to know that there's other family members, other families that mm-hmm. are experiencing the same thing. Sometimes that could just be a sense of relief to just know that I'm not in this alone. So yeah, right. there's, there's uh, other resources out there for family members right. as well to get the help that they need. Right. Because one of the things that happen is sometimes the person who is dependent on drugs and alcohol, they get better, but the family members don't. So then there's this tension yeah. that's going on. Mm-hmm. So we all have to heal together. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. good. Well, you know, uh, when you talked about just the being the non- non-judgmental, I, I heard something uh, a day or so to, ago that just made me stop for a minute. And this lady said, you know, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you, you know, extract from an apple, you get apple juice. But Christians, we're being squeezed. But what people are seeing, they're not seeing the Christianity in us. Mm. And so when you're non-judgmental and you meet people where they are and you just try to support them in love, that's that's really what we're to do, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know when we're trying to be supportive. So that just, um, that just really stuck with me. But it's a practice too. I think that even being Christian or whatever religious Mm -hmm. um, underpinnings we have is that we're all a work in progress. Oh, that we're not perfect. And so we are apt to fall short. That's right. Even in trying to help our loved ones. That's so to just give ourselves a break that being a Christian does not absolve me of being human. Right. Right. That yeah. I'm judgmental. I'm self-righteous. You know, all of these behaviors kind of come along with the human condition. Right. right. <laughs> and yeah. it's what we're all working through, you know, day to day. And so it's like, if I can give myself some grace, then I'm yeah. more apt to give other people grace, just right. knowing that I want to do the right thing, as Paul says, right? But every time I try to do right, yeah. God darn it, I say something stupid again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There yeah. I go again, be it myself. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned a couple of programs and resources. Um, were there, did you ever come across, or to your knowledge, are there any programs out there that were meant to be helpful but weren't? For me, well, so when I got clean in 1990 and I got clean in New York, so there wasn't as much available, Mm -hmm. but what I found in Narcotics Anonymous was enough for me. So, um, so I'm basically kind of a, I can make do with whatever. I mean, growing up on public assistance, (laughs) you kind of learn how to make do with whatever you have. And so I, it, it worked for me. Now, I won't say that it was a perfect solution because like anything, it's, you know, it has its, you know, uh, (laughs) faults, Mm -hmm. but overall it's what has worked for me. I still go to meetings. Even now I'm celebrating my 32 years um, as an anniversary. Mm -hmm. So I still, I'm still involved with the fellowship. So I have not had that experience where I sought help for my addiction. In fact, I just started going to therapy again, because, Mm -hmm. you know, as we navigate through life, I'm 63 years old. I mean, I've had some life experiences. So as we navigate, we hit, you know, roadblocks and we get stuck. And so, Hey, um, I'm a counselor by trade, a drug, Mm -hmm. you know, substance abuse counselor. That's my field. And so I still seek professional help to help me get Mm -hmm. through roadblocks that I, you know, tend to experience. So the 12 steps are great resource, but it's not the, it's not the total answer. And the church is a great resource. I'm a a ordained minister and Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's like, no, I still need help. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I still, I still mm-hmm. need to seek help for myself. It's like, so doctor mm-hmm. heal thyself. That's what I think that's a, a, a I believe it's a scripture, mm-hmm. right? You're, yeah. So you have yeah. to, yeah, you still need help. Although 32 years in this, I've achieved a whole lot. I've gotten uh, three master's degrees, some wow. certifications, and I, I'm an adjunct professor at Reynolds Community College. I have a life coach, but you know, so all these things, good, I'm married, and, mm-hmm. but there's areas where I still need to seek professional mm-hmm. help, and I do. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. And particularly, we need to um, promote that and say that mm-hmm. more in our community. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But now, were there changes that you had to make in your environment or relationships to ensure that you didn't relapse? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that they suggest is you stay away from people, places, and things. Playgrounds, playmates, and play things. You have to stay away from those things. And mm. so um, it almost like you, I re, early on, I thought, hey, you know, I could still go home the same way because, you know, in New York, I take the train, have to walk like maybe 10 blocks from the train station mm. home. Well, every day that I came home from work when I was using drugs, the drug dealer was on the way home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when I stopped, I kept coming home the same way and my body. So the, there's a book that's titled The Body Keeps Score. Oh, wow. Your body remembers everything. Mm-hmm. It has its own memory. And mm-hmm. so I'd come home, get off the train <laughs> and it's like, I'm not going to use today. But as soon as I get close, it's like my body would automatically turn into the drug dealers, but it would like automatically go there. Really? Mm-hmm. It's automatically. So I had to like, no, you can't, dr- you can't walk on this block, like go a different route. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I had to change the way, the, you know, how I can now it wasn't any longer. It may be okay. It may take you five more minutes to get home. Mm-hmm. Okay, well then take the you're gonna stay safe. Mm-hmm. My friends that I use drugs with, it's like I had to pull away from them because they were continuing in that. And that was, you know, because nobody when I came into the rooms of narcotics anonymous, I knew no one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so all my friends they continued to do because they didn't have a problem. I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know what their problem was. Yeah. I knew I had some dreams and some yeah. vision for my life that. It just wasn't, it was laying dormant and I wanted more for myself. So yeah, I had to stay away from, I had to be a better employee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people don't believe, you know, this It's like, I had such a bad disposition at work. My attitude was just awful. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I kept my job for all those years, Mm -hmm. but I did, but, you know, I had to change my attitude at work. You know, sometimes people don't know, like you're taking paper clips and you're taking, they got a whole closet full of all these office supplies and you just liberate them because, <laughs> hey, I don't need to buy this stuff. Yeah. I can just take a box. Yeah. It's stealing. Yeah. How about yeah. that? Yeah. You ask them, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You didn't ask them, can you take that? If, if you would have asked, they probably would have said yes, mm-hmm. but you just liberated yourself. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But you weren't you weren't yourself though. Think about it. Yeah. You yeah. were being influenced at that time by the drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So you didn't you probably didn't see it as that because I didn't see it as that, right? Yeah. hmm Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So I want to change gears a little bit and um talk a little bit about your jewelry business. Okay. Tell us about when did you start and what were the challenges and triumphs with that? So I started making jewelry in 2009 mm-hmm. and how I came into, so I've always loved fashion, fashion since I was a young girl, I've mm-hmm. always, so I was so thin when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I closed my, I was, had long legs long feet. And so mm-hmm. nothing really fit. Mm-hmm. And so I always had to add like, so do y'all remember back in the days when you put ribbon on your pants, you put them at the bottom, you frizz it out. Your yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you, you know, you were making an outfit. We were uh-huh. real creative. We cut up t-shirts back then. Now you're buying cut up t-shirts. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, we just took ourselves. Yeah. We were putting our own holes in our pants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've always had this, you know, love for fashion. And so there was a coworker who sold jewelry and I was buying jewelry from her all the time. 
And I just said, well, maybe I should learn how to make jewelry. And she told me a class that I could take. And I took this class here in Richmond. And that just opened up the door for me. So at first I was kind of doing it as a hobby. Mm-hmm. I sold jewelry, you know, sometimes. But last year during the pandemic, I was in a place where I wanted to, it's like I had, you know, many things that I was doing. It's like, okay, so what is it that you want to do with your life at this stage? And so I looked at, so I wrote some different things down to see like what I wanted to keep doing and what I wanted to get rid of. And so the jury was one of those things that I thought, okay, oh, you know, this is just a hobby. I'm just going to put that aside. And then I started dreaming in jewelry every night. Mm, what? Yeah, mm-hmm. God just kept giving me just different vision, different designs and all of this stuff. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Well, maybe this isn't just a hobby. <laughs> and so I decided um, I launched Jewelry Jazz by Melvina last July. Mm-hmm. I launched it as a viable, on yeah, that. as a viable business. So I've done a couple of Zoom jury shows. Actually, I have one coming up. Yeah. And so the challenges are, it's really keeping myself motivated and focused. That's what I, so, you know, I'm not one and I know money, we need money to do this, that, mm-hmm. and the other. But I think it's like, it's easy to get money. It's harder to, um, to step into your dream and stay in it. I find that much more challenging than the resources. The resources mm-hmm. will come, mm-hmm. but I get distracted. So I have spiritual ADHD. <laughs> and- <laughs> <laughs> so I'm more apt to be flying by the seat of my pants doing something else. And something else. I catch wind of something else. It's like, oh, they put this to the side and I'll go do that. Uh-oh. <laughs> So, yeah, so I have a, I mean, and I still have dreams about j- different jury designs. So you dream about jewelry. I dream that's, about that's jewelry your design. gift. Yeah, that is your gift. Yeah, yeah. that's what that yeah. says. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the other thing, uh, 25, like 25 years ago, so I had a, a goal to be a motivational speaker. So, mm-hmm. of course, as preachers, we are transformational and motivational and inspirational mm-hmm. in our messages. That's one of the things is to get people to change their behavior. But I, you know, Les Brown is one of my favorite mm-hmm. motivational speakers. And so 25 years ago, I'm like, that's what I want to do. And so I kind of put that to the side. But this year I decided to step into that arena. So on a different stage to just realize like being a coach to mm-hmm. people speaking you know, and so, yeah, I, um, I decided, okay, live your dream. So you just started that this year. I just started that, um, like uh, 30 days ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Got myself a life coach. It's like, okay, I've never really had, I had one mentor, my, um, my, my, well, I had two, I had a college professor who was a mentor and I had my pastor, a female pastor who was a mentor, but to have somebody to guide me in my career, it's like, wow. Um, so I realized like, again, I needed a therapist to kind of deal with some of the psychological things that were happening, but it's like, I need a life coach to help me to realize my dreams. I need a fitness person to help me with my physical, you know, so, so you got it. You got a team of folks. That's what I you got a it. team. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, and it, and it takes humility to realize to say, I need help in these areas mm-hmm. because I'll try to do it myself. It's like, but you, you won't be, you can start. So I'm a good starter, but I don't always finish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. But Melvina, how did then did you go from dropping out of high school to three masters? Mm-hmm. I mean, what is, how did that even happen? I was trying to make up for lost time, I guess. <laughs> Wow. But actually, well, so I moved here from New York to go to Virginia Union to mm-hmm. get a master's in divinity. And while I was at Virginia Union, I learned about chaplaincy. Mm-hmm. And so I did a residency um, at VCU, or they called it MCV at the time, mm-hmm. as a chaplain. And mm-hmm. so there was a master's program in patient counseling. And then after that, so those two degrees happened six months apart. 
Wow. And mm -hmm. then I was interested in becoming a licensed professional counselor. And so I had to go back to school and take some additional classes. And so then I got a master's in rehab, mm -hmm. rehabilitation counseling. Wow. And then once you're in the field, I mean, most fields, there's always a certification, a license. Right. So those are other things that you, you know, have to get to qualify yourself right. you know, to work right. in the field. So mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't a plan. The only plan was the masters of divinity. That was the plan. Those other ones kind of happened. It was a fluke. You know, <laughs> kind of like wow. That. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you. Um, yeah, for and sure. And certainly it's unfortunate times like these, Teresa and I often say, sometimes it's unfortunate that um, our audience can't see our guests because your jewelry is beautiful. It oh, is. So very um, nice. We certainly encourage people to uh, support you and check out. What's your website again? Jewelry Jazz by Melvina. Okay. Okay. So Melvina is Melvin with an A. Okay. Jewelry Jazz by Melvina.com. Sorry. I tell you, folks, it's beautiful jewelry. It is. So, um, Melvina, those are all of the questions that we have. Do you have some parting words for our audience today? Yes. Yeah, so, I would say, despite any challenges that you face in life, but one of the things I've learned is nothing is wasted, that God is able to use all of whatever my life experiences mm -hmm. are. So don't shit on yourself. You know, self-doubt is a part of our, you know, of living that we, we, we're going to doubt ourselves, but don't doubt God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and try not to doubt yourself. It's like, you can hear it, but, but then move forward mm -hmm. that it's never too late to live your dream. It's mm -hmm. never too late. You're never too old mm -hmm. to step into whatever it is that God has for you. This this afternoon, I was working on a message. I'm participating in a uh, women's her fire tour this weekend mm -hmm. in short pump. And so I was preparing my message and I wrote something that had never occurred to me because a lot of time we hear about God's plan for our life. Mm -hmm. And it came to me, God, the word plan is plural. It is not a singular word. It is plural. Mm -hmm. God's plan means God can have more, it's more than one thing in the plan for you to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it might be teaching, but teaching, teaching has many prongs to it. There are several right. things that That's you right. can do. So uh, don't get stuck or like, well, I'm not interested in God's plan, but God's plan is better than any plan you can ever come up with because yeah. the, it's like multiple income streams, right. multiple opportunities. You get to meet yourself. How about that? Like more yeah. than anything else, you're going to meet you. Oh my goodness. When That's you powerful. finally meet you, mm -hmm. what, yeah. huh, what a day of rejoicing it is yeah. going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wow. Well, Melvina, thank you so much for joining us here today at um, Earrings Off and Folks, I want our audience to know we had a subscriber that said to us, we have to speak with her. And um, so we at Teresa and I encourage you that if you've got any great guests that you want us to speak with, like Melvina, please send that information to earringsoff at gmail.com. Melvina, thank you again for joining us. And we wish you all the very best. And thank you all so much. I really enjoyed this conversation because it truly was a conversation. Thank you for your excellent interviewing skills. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, you make it easy. Take good care. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.